Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 2. V22, Chapter 262 Epilogue PT1. Written by PWO Falcon. Talras Forest. Date, April 22, 2028. Staring out the side of the Vela Tilt Rotor helicopter side window, Lieutenant Colonel Jackson Sharp saw a reflection of Edo's on a nearby lake. Looking out, he saw two other Vela in formation as a formation of six prepared their final approach. It has been two years since the War of Two Worlds ended. Within that time a great number of things have changed. After Empress Pina Kov Lada was officially crowned most of the major cities sided with her administration. There were some who opposed and remained loyal to the old regime, however that did not last long. When an armor unit appeared with a certain imperial general with a very legendary background, while riding on top of that very same armored column scared most of the rebel cities into submission. Outside of skirmishes and partisanship, most of the fighting died down. The only exception came from an alliance between the Oprichnina and the Hario tribe. Being espionage by nature they proved harder to eradicate than other rebel groups. As part of the peace agreement, the 8th Infantry, Alnus, division remained stationed on Falmart with the mandate to protect American territories around Alnus, but as part of the NATO Stabilization Force. Their mission was to help the new republic to clear out rebels and prevent the continent from collapsing like what happened in Libya. Iraq, and Afghanistan. For the Vanguard program, they were officially split off from the 75th Rangers and became their own unit. Jackson? Rory asked. Looking away from the window, Sharp saw Rory Mercury sitting uncomfortably in a seat. Unlike in the past when she had a petite body which allowed her to fit nearly inside military space without issue, now being uplifted to a proto-angel she has become a more fully grown adult woman with short wings. Still enjoying the wings? Sharp asked. Rory gave him a frown. Yes, it is just, it makes things uncomfortable at times. I knew you missed being a midget, Sharp said with a wink. Anyway, what is it? Rory again shot him a glare before going to the rear of the helicopter. Realizing what Rory was referring to, he looked at the back of the helicopter. Sitting there was a girl in a blue dress with white lacing and a bow scattered around the shoulders, back, and chest. With white eyes and goldfish brown hair, she held her shoulders as she breathed heavily. It was clear that she was struggling to prepare for this mission. Sharp looked over to Rory and the two chuckled at the sight. All right. Moving toward the back, bypassing the other vanguard warriors, he sat down next to the side of the girl. Take slow breaths and focus on what is in front of you. I tried. I did not know it was going to be fighting. Marley, Rory said. Emroy is the god of war. Of course, you would have to fight and kill people. I do not know how you all do this, Marley said. I have tried and tried dash dot. Sharp placed his hand in front of Marley. Stare at my hand. Once he saw that Marley focused on his hand he continued, Marley. Never try. Always do. Once you accept that, everything else will fall in line. Marley took a deep breath and wiped the stressful tears from her cheeks. Okay. I think I am calm. As I said before. Once we land, remove all unnecessary thoughts and only think about the task at hand. Protect your friends and attack the enemy before they attack you. I understand, Marley said. Just give me a moment. With a pat on the shoulder, Sharp moved back to his original seat. Thank you, Rory said. Were you this scared when you first became an apostle? Sharp asked. I was more accepting of it when I first became one, but it is never easy in the beginning. For anyone. The early years of an apostle can be very dangerous as they are still untrained and unsure of their abilities. Second Lieutenant Andrew Steele leaned in. You would think the gods would leave a manual. With the reshuffling of the Vanguard program, Sharp pushed Andrew to become an officer. Seeing the young man as loyal and committed, Andrew would make a perfect officer for the changing world. You would think, Rory replied. Staring back at Marley, Sharp remembered when they first found her. Once Rory was uplifted to a new realm and became a half-angel. That meant Emroy would need a replacement, Apostle. It did not take long to find her, located more to the western side of Falmart. 
From there, Rory and Sharp had been training her to be Rory's faithful replacement. Reaching the landing zone, the Valus hovered above the tree line. Underneath the aircraft are circular pods that were dropped to the ground. Once they hit the ground, they glowed blue, and a burst of energy was projected in all directions. The blast cut the trees down and created a makeshift landing zone for the tilt rotor helicopters. They lowered themselves until they were close enough for the soldiers to exit. The Oprichnina Ahario tribe shifted their operations into the mountains, cities, and dense forests, which were harder for US forces to find an assault. With the new clearing tool, a hybrid of science and magic, it was hoped this would allow Vanguard to get right up against the enemy before they could react. Once Vanguard and the two apostles landed, Sharp saw the enemy camp. From the feed from the Valus, it seemed that they caught the enemy by surprise. Surround and swarm. The four Vanguard teams quickly assaulted the camp. While many were new, many of the NCOs like Andrew were veterans from the war. With the two Rose Knights team, they were transformed from Pina's Club of Princess into a rapid response special force. It was decided while the leaders had moved on with their loved ones, the spirit of their knighthood should remain. Two strong energy bursts inside the enemy camp from two Rose Mags. A team of bolt-action crossbow units fired alongside the Vanguard riflemen as the swordsmen prepared to storm the camp. A large gust of flames burst from the camp, forcing many of their soldiers to take cover. Sir, Andrew said. Large contact. A large, deformed humanoid charged forward. When the old empire invaded Philadelphia, they kidnapped hundreds of citizens. While most were rescued, manufacturers were given to the Hario tribe for their secret experiments. They believed that Terran technology was partly related to their genetics. As part of their research, they mutated many of their prisoners and turned them into mind-controlled monster foot soldiers. The vanguards engaged the incoming mutate however, it was carrying a large boulder that was deflecting their bullets. Rory, Marley, go, Sharp ordered. The two apostles flanked the soldiers to face the new threat. The mutant tossed its boulder toward the infantry. Rory took her halberd and sliced it in half while Marley charged forward. Taking her long sword, she rammed it into the mutant thick muscle chest. I did it, Marley said until she looked up, noticing the giant beast staring down at her. Rory. What should I do now? Kill it silly, Rory said. Use your strength and agility and leap over it. Marley was forced to pull her sword out of the mutant as he reached for her. She then sliced the beast and leaped over him, carrying her blade into it until her weapon carved him in half. Good job, Rory said. Stay in the game you too, Sharp said. Everyone, press. The melee rose knights formed two columns and marched inside the camp while the ranged forces provided protection. Using their shields as protection from the desperate attacking Oprichnina and Hario pigmen. Once they breached the camp they splintered and started cutting down anyone who opposed them. Once the enemy defensive position cracked, the rest of the vanguard and ranged knights pressure forward, securing the area. Within moments, the few survivors started to surrender except for the pigmen who were quickly tranquilized as they are known to explode from a genetic gas chamber within their bodies. They prefer to die than be captured, making it hard for them to be captured for integration. Giving the all-clear sign, Sharp left his position and was escorted by Rory and Marley. As they walked, the new apostle couldn't stop talking about how scared and excited she was for fighting such an opponent, which Rory teased that was only the beginning of her journey. Andrew, report, Sharp said. It seems we caught them completely by surprise, Andrew said. They didn't get the chance to burn their documents or anything. Good, Sharp said. It seems that we might finally be putting this resistance to an end. Bring in the second team and load them up in the Chinook once it arrives. Sharp walked through the camp, witnessing more of the usual genetic modification chambers he saw during Operation Ghost Soldier. The only word he could muster was horrific, but even that word struggled to state the emotion of the sight. Sadly, he had become accustomed to the sight as this had been reported from every Hario tribe base. I cannot believe this, Marley commented. How could they do such a thing? She then looked toward the group of surviving Oprichnina. She pulled her sword out and was about to slaughter them all until Rory grabbed her arm. Do not act like that, Rory said. We need them. 
but look what they have done. Marley angrily replied. We are apostles, is this not what we are supposed to do? Punish those who we see fit? Not like this, Rory said. We are here to help them, not to do what we see fit. Trust me, they will be punished, but the right way. She glared at the Oprichnina who she was about to murder. Fine. Sharp shook his head, impressed by how much Rory had grown. That was when he noticed Andrew approaching. To be honest, Andrew said. If I was her, I would have swung. And no one would blame you, Sharp said. But she needs to learn the rules. Power does not equal right. I know, Andrew said. I do not want to go back to the days we had to fight apostles. Spent too many lives on that game. Same here. Any information on Sven Hard? Not yet. He is definitely a snake. The words never rang true. Sven Hard Lapu's Moon, the ex-leader of the Oprichnina, has proven to be a hard nut to find. He was one of the men who pushed the betrayal against the Legion during the war for his own self-interests, and while it helped lead to the end of the war, he proved to allow himself to go into the underground. The last time Sharp ran into the man was when Vanguard, Seven assisted in rescuing the Propeace faction at Sadira. As part of a plan with Zorzal to trap him, using the wife and daughter of a senator as human shields, Moon's wife ended up killed during the exchange. He swore revenge and escaped with his two kids. While he believed it was an empty threat, the fact that he still had not been captured left a hole in his gut. One thing he learned from the war, anything could happen. Almas, Alcatris, Fulmart. Date, April 22, 2028. As the class of students left, Sarah leaned back into her chair as she brushed her hands through her long hair, exhausted from a long day. Finals were coming and the stress of the growing school size finally got to her. I see you survived? Nariko said as she entered the room. Survived? Sarah asked and then laughed. There are always those two troublemakers that have to spice things up. Test time has always been stressful because it is so hard to convince them that their education matters. I really want them to pass but getting them to study is hell. It is just not in their culture yet. You cannot help everyone, Nariko said as she took a seat and pulled out her lunch. Sarah understood how true that was. All she could do was her best. Hearing a notebook hitting the ground, she looked over the fairy assistant, Sibyl who was cleaning up after the students. Oops, sorry, Sibyl said. It was too heavy. It is okay, Sarah replied as she noticed Nariko giggling. Sibyl, take a break and come over here. You were telling me that you got a letter from one of your companions recently do you mind sharing? I did. Sibyl said with much excitement. She flew over and buzzed next to the two women. It was from Melina, but I got an update from the others too. Really? Nariko said. How is everyone? They are all good, Sibyl said. Melina and Nelia are the ones who mostly write to me. Melina is busy keeping the general and your husband in line, Sarah, but you already know about that. Sarah couldn't help but place her hand on her forehead, remembering the report of how the two got trapped in an Oprichnina trap six months ago. Went MIA for three days and were found at a nearby bar. Apparently, they had a bet who could have defeated the ground quicker, got too deep in trouble and Rory and Marley had to save them. She does not remember all the details as she decided she didn't want to know. Yes, she has to keep an eye on them. She is still struggling to adapt to a noble's life at the capital, Sibyl said. Always moving from one place to another, she finds it strange being in one place. If it was not for their kids, she claims she would have gone insane. Strange, Nariko commented. I thought kids were the ones that make you go insane. Sarah chuckled and sipped her drink. And the rest? Nelia is having a good time in Ellie's with Latia, Sibyl said. She was acting as a servant but became Fabia's second wife. I hear she's going to be a mommy soon too. Oh my, they have been busy, Nariko responded. Not just growing his region but his family too, huh? Sarah added with a chuckle. How did Latia feel about that? Oh, don't worry, he got permission. 
She was the one who suggested it, Sibyl replied as Noriko and Sarah giggled. Alden has helped the Woodline State grow as much as he could and has moved on from there, hoping to find opportunities elsewhere. Really? I heard he left because Hodder chased him around for a good while as he tried to seduce his daughter, Tuka, Sarah said with a more serious tone. That could also be, but he has moved on to do what he normally likes doing. I hear he works at a tavern now, playing music. But I think that is only a ploy to meet women. Apparently, his music is doing well on earth so Melina says he might be going there to seduce women with it and his charm. That sounds lovely, Sarah said, rolling her eyes, realizing that plot would work. How is Cryun? Noriko asked. Is she still helping newcomers integrate into Alnus? She is doing good, Sibyl said. We had a meal last week. Her work keeps her busy, almost comedic at times. Teaching people how a light switch works brings many different reactions. She jokes that she would be rich if she would capture their reaction and put it on your invisible computer web. The internet I think you call it. That is funny, Noriko replied. But I bet they see it as magic. But it has been helpful from what I hear, especially those scared and looking for a new start. I always knew she had a big heart, Sibyl finished with a smile. Well, I'm glad she was able to find a place here for herself, Noriko said. I know how comforting it is to know someone's there worrying about you when you feel so alone. Sensing the conversation might be taking a negative turn, Sibyl quickly changed the subject. Anyway, how is James? Sibyl asked. Is the new job working well? He is settling in good, Noriko replied as she ate a rice ball. It took a while for him to adjust, but I think he will like this construction job. The money should allow me to remain as a housewife. Private construction had become a major booming industry in Alnus and the territory estate of Alcatraz. Once the military left and those facilities were transferred to civilian use, Alnus became the heart of the continent. People from both worlds migrated to Alnus or the nearby settlements for many different reasons, ranging from exploration, research in magic and other fantasy elements, the fusion of magical manufacturing, and so on. Everyone seeking opportunities in this new era would travel there. The line of work for Noriko's husband should last decades. For Noriko, Sarah is thrilled that she had recovered from her enslavement. While she was employed at the school it gave her the flexibility, she needed to focus on herself. That is good, Sarah said. You have to keep your man busy. Is that why you let Jackson still work in the military? Noriko asked. After everything he has been through, I would want my man to quit. As I said, you need to keep your man busy, Sarah said. I would love it if Jackson retired from the army, but I know he needs it. I don't see him doing well in the civilian market. I think you are right, Noriko said. Hearing a small feminine voice coming from the door, Sarah turned and saw two young girls. One human was called Aria and the other was a dark elf named Karai. Both girls joined the school four months ago and while they had never seen any Terran technology or educational knowledge, before they quickly became some of her top students. Eagerly willing to learn. What can I do for you too? Sarah asked before rolling her eyes. Stupid question. You want to see John? Of course, Aria said. The baby of the hero of Fulmart. Yes, you can. Sarah got up from her seat with Noriko and left the classroom. Sibyl waved goodbye and continued with her tasks tidying up the classroom. While the school was small it had grown over the past two years as more parents wanted at least one of their children to learn the ways of the Terrans. It had gained much support within the community. In the back of the school, Sarah established a small nursery. It was her idea when they moved into a bigger building to help student teen mothers and employees like Noriko and herself. Feeling Noriko's elbow, Sarah then noticed the two girls giggling behind them. She wondered if this was how she acted at their age when the teachers brought their children to school. They reached the nursery and Sarah opened it. Inside she saw a large playpen with Yao taking care of the children. Mrs. Sharp, Yao said. Is everything okay? Yes, Sarah said. The kids want to see my son again. Yao laughed. He is a popular one with the ladies. 
All right girls, Sarah said. Be nice to him. She watched as the two walked in and headed to John. The dark elf reached into her backpack and pulled out a local doll and handed it to him. Do you ever get tired of that? Nariko asked. I would have gone crazy by now. Taking a deep breath, Sarah nodded. While she found it cute how many kids like her son, it could be overwhelming. Being the wife of a hero had its benefits and curses. For one thing, any moment of privacy and peace in public life had gone out the door. I have grown used to it, Sarah said. I cannot really blame people, we have been a major part of Alnus since the beginning. It will die off sooner or later but until then I will manage. Hearing her child, Sarah stood up and walked over. All right girls, that is enough. But he is so cute, Karai said. I want one so badly, Aria said. When you get older, Sarah said. You're both way too young for that responsibility. Teacher, I am 15, Aria said. If it was not because of your people's rules I would have been married by now. And that is what we call progress dear, Sarah said. Now out. The two girls giggled and rushed out of the room. Nariko approached after they were left alone and asked, I cannot understand why they want baby so much. It is just cultural differences, Sarah said as she placed her hand on her forehead. Aria isn't wrong per se. By their standards they are of adult age. Trying to crush 2,000 years of social development within a decade isn't easy and they are just being silly. At least they focus on their studies, Nariko said. What are you doing after school? I am heading over to the market before heading home, Sarah said. Dad is going to be home in the next two days, and we want to do something special. Nariko giggled. Kids. Anyway, mind if I tag along? Sarah quickly realized that Nariko did not want to go home and be alone while her husband was at work, which she could understand. One of the reasons she remained at the school was just to stay busy. Sure, Sarah replied. You are always welcome. I hear there is a fresh shipment today. Once school ended, the two grabbed their kids and headed toward the market, which turned out to be busier than she expected. From what she could a trade convoy came from Italica today which explained why it was so busy. I have to say, Nariko said as the two passed through the market. This place has changed a lot since when it was first built. Yes, it has, Sarah said. She saw a dwarf selling fruit to a female Nico and an elf. While the stand is still built in the traditional method of this world, the dwarf had adopted tablets and a credit system. Some of the other stands even had television screens that listed prices, information on products, and so on. The market showed what the rest of Alnus had become, a hybrid of this world and of Earth. It just shows how people can adopt and change. As the two stopped by the bakery, Sarah heard someone call out her name. Turning around, she saw Delilah with her two children. Among them was Persia, a Nico Scott married after the war. Hi there, Sarah said. I did not expect to see you all today. I thought you guys were in Italica? Scott got a job with the convoy company, Persia said. I like to come with him on these trips. And I came to say hi to an old friend, Delilah said as she pulled out her cell phone. I tell you, these are amazing. Just don't make TikTok videos, Nariko mumbled. Persia laughed before looking at the two boys. These are your kittens? They are very cute. Thank you, Sarah said as she adjusted John in her arms so her two friends could see better. I would say though, Nariko said. They do get heavy by this age. But he just loves to be carried by mommy. That is so cute, Persia said as she rubbed the fur on her paw on John's face, making him sneeze. I bet both of them will be fine gentlemen when they grow up. So, Delilah, how are your dash, Sarah started to say before she saw the bunny's facial reaction. Delilah's eyes were glued to John, like he was a target or prey. An eyesight that Sarah had never seen before. Sarah couldn't help but bring John closer to her body. Can. I help you, Delilah? Is everything okay? Delilah blinked and then smiled. Yes, I am sorry. I just had a memory from the war. Do you mind if I can hold John? I never had before and like to see the hero baby myself. 
While Sarah had gotten used to hearing that request and normally, she wouldn't mind that much, especially with a close friend. However, all her senses were screaming not to hand over her child to Delilah. Something fell off. I think he is good right now. Maybe later at my place? I am sorry, Delilah said as she lightly pushed one of her daughters behind her legs. But I really would like to see him, at least once before I leave. I will have to get back to Bailey. It is okay, Delilah, Persia said. He is not going anywhere, if Sarah does not want to hand him over, it is okay. John suddenly started crying as he struggled within his mother's arms. Sarah wondered if the excitement was getting too much for him. I am sorry, it is probably best for him to go home. It is his nap time. Delilah released a frustrated breath. I am very sorry. The bunny then grabbed Sarah by the arm and extended her claws, thrusting them into John and ripping the boy out of her arms. Horrified by what had just happened, Sarah grabbed Delilah's arm and used all her strength to try and pull John back. She found herself struggling from the superior bunny strength, unable to overpower her friend and free her baby. What are you doing? Let him go. Let go, Sarah, Delilah yelled. Trust Dash. John let out a loud cry before he knocked Delilah and Sarah to the ground. Once freed he fell to the ground, however, he quickly grew into a ten-foot-tall monster that was covered in tan fur and razor-sharp claws. People in the surrounding area screamed and started fleeing. The beast let out a loud roar before turning around to face Sarah. The monster raised its arm as it prepared to strike. Sarah looked up, eyes widened as her mind rejected what she had just witnessed. John? Delilah hopped next to Sarah and grabbed her, pulling her to the side. Girls, watch over Sarah and Nariko. Get them to safety so mommy can deal with this shapeshifter. Sarah watched as Delilah rushed away and started fighting the shapeshifter. She felt Nariko grab her tightly, asking if she was hurt, however, she ignored it. The only thing in her mind was that her child, John, was in her arms and suddenly turned into a monster. She only then realized what Delilah said. Bunnies are the only known species on Uush that are able to see past shapeshifter abilities which mean her son was never her son. John